I want to begin this morning with the reading of our scripture. It comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And I would ask you, if you would, to stand with me as we read God's word. Once again, Heavenly Father, we come before you. I pray, Lord, that, <coughs> excuse me, whatever is causing this uh, congestion and stuff all of a sudden, it wasn't here in the first service, uh, you take it away, Father, and that you would strengthen my voice, that I would be able to uh, properly present your word. But then again, I just would like you to set me aside and just speak through me, that your word would go forth as you so desire. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. They, they help each other to succeed. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Father, thank you for your precious word. Let us receive it with joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. I think we all understand that it is always better to have a companion. It's always better to have somebody that has your back. When Jesus sent out the disciples, he sent them out two by two because he knew that one person can be easily swayed. And when a cord of three strands is there, it is not easily broken. I, like, I liken the two strands to the horizontal relationship of man to man and that third strand, that vertical relationship with Jesus. And that third cord, that third strand in that knot or that uh, intertwined rope gives it strength. On Wednesday morning, we have our men's breakfast in at the Marysville Diner. And every Wednesday, we typically read whatever the daily devotional is there for Knights of the 21st Century. That's something Niall started right off the bat. This week, I read the... the devotional, and I've got to tell you, it struck a chord with me. It made me realize that no man is an island, that we just cannot really succeed in life and in afterlife without help. We need someone to hold us accountable. We need someone to help us. We need someone to lift us up when we're down. And we need to do that for others. We need accountability partners. We need each other is what it boils down to. God created us to be relational beings. It is his intention that we live together as brothers and sisters in Christ, part of the family of God. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become his child. And his family is fully functional, even in its dysfunction. Figure that one out. God's kingdom is fully functional. Sometimes we slip up a bit and cause a little bit of dysfunction. But he, he is still fully functional. And in him, we can be fully functional. As we see in our scripture, scripture lesson this morning... <clears throat> Accountability is a biblical concept. It is something that God created. For us, it is also an act of our will. Therefore, the title of the message is, It Starts With You. We must individually decide to be accountable to someone or a group of people. The Life Application Study Bible says cooperating with each other has advantages. Life is designed for companionship, not isolation. For intimacy, not loneliness. Now, I know that some people prefer isolation, perhaps thinking they can't trust anyone. 
But we need to understand that we are not on earth to serve ourselves. We are here to serve others and to serve our Lord. So don't isolate yourself. Please, please, please don't try to do life alone. I can tell you from experience, it does not work. Seek companions. Become a team player. The power to resist temptation is stronger when we are accountable to someone. Did you catch that? Catch that? The power to resist temptation is stronger when we are accountable to someone. This morning, we're talking about accountability. And I want to thank WJBW, or Women Journaling the Bible, WJTB, <laughs> Women of the Bible, because I got a lot of the information this morning from their website, and I very much appreciate it. I always glean from other, from the Bible and from the Holy Spirit and from things I find on the internet or things I find in other readings. This was so good, I just grabbed some of it and just threw it in here, and I told them that I was going to do that. So I don't know if they actually gave me permission to do it or not. But thank you so much. I appreciate that. We're going to be looking at accountability in a couple of different ways here. First of all, understanding that we are accountable to God. That is not a choice. When God created us, we became accountable to him. And so that is not our choice. Now, the accountability to each other is our decision. We need, we need to decide that we are going to become accountable for somebody and to somebody if we want to get involved with an accountability partner or multiple partners. And then there's always that question, why do we avoid that partnership? Well, one of those reasons I just brought up, because some people think they can't trust others. And frankly, there are people you can't trust. And so when you choose an accountability partner, you choose somebody that you know you can trust. We're going to look at uh, what accountability is not and what it does mean. So beginning with we are accountable to God, as usual, Jesus sets the example for us. In John chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, it says, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Jesus himself sets the example. He was accountable to the Father. Now, he was God himself, so he made himself accountable. He chose to make himself accountable to himself. Figure that one out. But because of the triune nature of God, he literally was accountable to God the Father. In John chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases Him. How many of us always do what God pleases? Amen. Amen. Okay. I thought I was the only one. I was afraid to raise my hand, you know. Number two are, is that we are accountable to each other. And I added to this, we are accountable to each other in love. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17 says that if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. In love, just want to make sure we're in there, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Sometimes you need a witness or two there. If they still refuse to listen, 
tell it to the elders, and if they refuse to listen to the elders, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. We don't have any tax collectors here, do we? Because we don't want to treat our tax collectors bad. What this saying is we need to make each other accountable. And if we have done something to offend someone or someone has offended us, our responsibility is to go to that person in love and try to help them become accountable for their actions. Or if we have sinned, hopefully those who love us will come to us and say, you know what, I noticed you did this. I love you and I want the best for you. In Ephesians chapter 5, 21, it says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does that mean to you? That means if, to me, if we love, Lord, love the Lord, we will live in deference to others. We will defer to others. We will yield to others. Now, if we're right and they're wrong, it doesn't mean we go smack them. But we will come to them in love and say, hey, get, listen, uh, you know, once again, I, I think there's something amiss here. Can we work it out? Thirdly, why do we avoid accountability? Dr. Howard Hendricks spoke on this subject. And he said, accountability is a double-headed coin. In our culture here in the United States of America, we have a me, myself, and I mentality. It didn't used to be that way, but it has developed into that in the United States of America. We think we are entitled to everything. And though for us who have accepted Jesus, that should go away, but that mentality is very difficult to overcome. it frankly sabotages our Christian walk because we tend to be, and especially guys, we tend to be concerned with building and maintaining our image, our personal brand, if you would, developing the brand. But God's word instructs us to follow Christ and be like him, to please God and not be concerned about impressing others. We need to shift from impressing others to pleasing God. And you'll see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 25. Again, you're welcome to take pictures of that. Check those scriptures out when you go home. And lastly, the natural tendency of this flesh is to desire to live independently of God. Men think we're self-made but we're not. It is not good for a man to be without a mate. God knew what we were going to be like when he first created Adam. But I'm so thankful for my mate, and I'm accountable to her, she's accountable to me, but I also have other accountability partners because I know what my flesh is capable of. And I know that if I spend too much time with myself, the temptations start to flood my mind. And I know I'm not the only one that can say that. That is why we need accountability. Because the flesh and the carnal mind naturally tend to depart from the plan of righteousness and return to its old ways. Two weeks ago, I was talking about the Civil War and how the, many of the slaves that were freed after the Civil War went back and were right under the rule of their masters again. They fell right back into that pattern. When we don't have accountability, we tend to backslide. Is that true? Just, just want to make sure. I'm actually getting ready to hold that up. We tend also, especially guys here again, and I, I don't know about women because I've never been one, I was trapped in the body of one for nine months, but that was the closest experience I had. 
we have a tendency to present a good image to other people. We put on that 50 cent smile. It used to be a 10 cent smile, but you know, everything's gone up. We put on that 50 cent smile and we make everybody think that we're fine and we're not. Sometimes we're hurting deeply. And if you're living by yourself, if you've isolated yourself from other people, who do you go to? That's a good thing. But God created us to relate with other people. God created us to share our burdens. That is why when you look into the book of Hebrews, we are told not to forsake getting together on Sundays or whenever we gather together for worship because we can lift each other up. And I don't know about you, but there are many days that I need lifted up. So we present this image to others that, we, that we're fine, and then we just basically live another truth for ourselves because we know what's really happening inside of us. We operate in one plane and kind of live on another. And the Lord tells us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, that we are not to live in, with a double standard. We need to be stretched. Our faith, our POV, our point of view in God needs to constantly expand to reach our full spiritual attention. It, spiritual what? Spiritual potential. That word didn't come out. To reach our spiritual potential. We'll see that in John chapter 14, verse 12, if you read that, because I'm not reading it to you right now. Anyway, what accountability is not? Accountability is not legalism. Well, and I were discussing this yesterday, and we have friends that go to a church that very legalistic. Matter of fact, Luella and I were told not to go back to another one church because we didn't preach from the King James Bible. That's legalism. I love the King James. I love the King James. But there are times that some of the other versions are more understandable. This church we were talking about, though, I said, you know what? Oddly enough, though, when you look at that congregation, they really look like they've got it all together. They're, they're serving the Lord. They're showing up on Sunday mornings. But is that the way to operate? Feeling like you're under the thumb of the pastor or under the thumb of God? God gave us freedom. God gave us freedom. So accountability is not legalism. It's not designed to cause false guilt or to force a bunch of man-made rules on someone. And I said this earlier, and I'll say it again. We each need to choose. We need to choose our own goals. We need to choose our own objectives out of a desire to please God not mankind, not to please ourselves, not to please anybody else. Accountability is not snooper vision or snobber vision. You like that one? <laughs> We're not called to be busybodies. We're not called to inspect each other's fruit for the purpose of satisfying our own curiosity or gossiping about it. Nor are we to use another person's spiritual ordeals as an opportunity to lift ourselves up. Accountability is not a basis for gossip. Proverbs 11, 12, and 13, we are not to violate the confidence of someone for the purpose of conversation. I don't know if you remember this story, but I was speaking about gossip one time and I was saying that uh, there was a lady in the church that was a church gossip. And one day she saw the deacon's car parked out in front of the bar. And it was there all day long. Boy, the next day in church, she was telling everybody about it. That night, he parked his car in front of her house and left it there all night long. Just saying. I heard about three pastors that were out in a boat fishing. 
And while they were there, of course, they were, you know, they were talking theology, and then they got to talking about, about accountability. And they decided that they were going to be accountability partners. And the first pastor began to confess some of the things that was in his life. Actually, one of the pastors first said, let me go last. So, okay, they decided to let him go last. The first pastor was talking about the struggles and stuff he has in his life. The second pastor did that. The third pastor confessed, you know what? I am the biggest gossip in town. Uh, anyway. The last three points you should have received on a handout when you came in this morning, uh, I'll, I'll briefly go over them, but I want you to take those with you and I want you to digest them. Also, you should have gotten a paper regarding what is coming up next Sunday. Next Sunday is Sanctity of Life Sunday and we're going to have a special service here at 8 and 1030. And there are some things that we're collecting for the, uh, for the babies that were not aborted and to help the mamas out that decided they were not going to abort those children. For those of you watching online, uh, you'll see a link there at the bottom. Actually, it's not a link. It's a statement that says, just go to glenvalechurch.com slash live dash stream and click on the download button there. And you can download these and print them or save them in a PDF if you want to go over them. Number six is what does it mean to be accountable? That's again, a kind of a sensitive area because in our culture, we've kind of got into the mindset of mind your own business. I remember saying that when I was a kid, mind your own business. Even within the church, we get an attitude of, you know, what I do at home is my business, not your business. Well, there's truth in that statement, but if we want to be successful in life and be, pre be prepared to lead others into eternal life, then we need to be careful about what we do and what we say. We become defensive if a brother or sister says, you know what, hey, I haven't seen you in, seen you in church in a while. Well, that opens a can of worms. Many people live their entire lives with an attitude, you know, I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. Again, guys, we, we have a tendency to do that. And uh, maybe because we get a bit prideful. We, we don't like to be under the authority of somebody else, but we are all under the authority of God. And so we need to live for him. Number seven, what does it mean being accountable to someone? It's being honest with them. It's being truthful. It's being genuine. It's being transparent. Now, in the early years of my life, <clears throat> that actually up into midlife, I was a very prideful person. I didn't take responsibility for anything that I did that was wrong. Now, I understand that when I do something or say something wrong, I need to apologize for it. There have been some things in the past 18 years that I've done that or said here that I've had to just say, you know what, I'm just a human being. Please forgive me. How easy is that? We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And if we love each other as a family, we'll forgive each other as a family. We have to be humble. We have to be willing to submit our lives to somebody else. We need to find a person or persons that we can trust, that we can share the real things that are going on in our life. When Pastor Dave was pastoring the second campus we had out in Shermanthale, it was called Real Life. And it was about dealing with real life issues, and we are doing that this year. We are doing that this coming Sunday, dealing with the, the uh, lack of uh, concern for human life. And, and the last two Sunday nights in February and the, last, and the first Sunday night in March, we have Dr. Kimberly Deerdorf coming, and she'll be speaking about just kind of some of the mental issues that we deal with from a spiritual standpoint. You know, especially during the holiday seasons, and even now when the, when the days are sometimes very dreary, we get down. 
Let's see, talks about some of those things and how to deal with them, dealing with depression, dealing with all kinds of things. So mark your calendars, the last two Sunday nights in February and the first Sunday in March. We need to be humble enough to ask for advice sometimes. I mean, there are times that, that I just don't know the answer. I'll go into the Word of God, but I'll also, go, I'll also go to some people that I know that are spiritual mature and say, what do, you, what do you see in this? Am I missing something here? Especially Luella, she is so spiritually deep, she often just comes off with these nuggets that are just out of this world. We need to be teachable, we need to be trainable, we need to be approachable. We need, on our part, to be willing to invest our lives into the lives of those that we partner with. Because accountability is reciprocal. You're accountable to them, they're accountable to you. We have to understand also that we need to respect our accountability partner. So when you choose, choose wisely. Don't choose the pastor that's the town gossip. Choose somebody that you know you can trust. And build a bond of respect for one another, a bond of trust as you go. And accountability for me works best when I know that the person I'm accountable to cares deeply about me. And I recommend that you find somebody that cares deeply about you, that wants you to experience the best that God has for you. And then the question is, how do you keep a person accountable? It is always in the context of a relationship, which takes us right back to the beginning of the message where God created us to be relational with one another and with him. And the stronger the relationship, the greater is accomplished through it. And sometimes it takes a while to build that relationship, to build that trust, to build the mutual respect, to be able to bear your burdens to the other person and to hear theirs. But when we do that, we become spiritually mature. And through the direction of the Holy Spirit, we become more and better disciples, discipling other people, living a life full of joy, even on the worst days, able to leap tall buildings at a single bat. No, wait, that's not right. <clears throat> we do become all that we can be in Christ Jesus. I'll take you back to this. You probably can't read it there, but I'm going to read it again. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And that's not necessarily speaking physically. Spiritually, it's very important to have someone to help you. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not easily broken or quickly broken. Maintain a good horizontal relationship with your accountability partner and a good vertical relationship with God, and you will get through this life in victory. Amen? I want to end <clears throat> by reading the devotional that I read this past Wednesday. It is from Steve Sable. Steve is a, the, has the Knights of the 21st Century Group in Lancaster and Lebanon County. It is a very large group of men. But before I read that, I want to make a point. Since COVID, many of us have been living isolated lives. We can order groceries and they're delivered to our door. <clears throat> We can DoorDash or Grubhub food from the local restaurants. We can conduct business via the internet. We can even get mental health counseling on the internet. Now I've been seeing those ads. All of these things that are being done are keeping you isolated from the rest of the world. And that leads to destruction as we will hear. Steve says, isolation is a killer. 
To remain unconnected in a meaningful, accountable way with other godly men or women is an invitation to disaster. Bob, a young man I mentored in the ministry in the early 90s, was once a Wall Street investment banker. He was successful, articulate, bright, and highly educated. He was a married man with four beautiful daughters. He accepted Christ and subsequently sensed a call into the ministry. He planted a church here in central Pennsylvania. The ministry grew and prospered under his capable leadership. Steve said we would meet periodically over lunch, and our connection of trust allowed us to go into places of accountability that kept us both on track, kept us both spiritually healthy. But over a period of time, it seemed like he vanished. I emailed him and called him several times, but didn't get a response. I wrote it off as him just being too busy or distractions in his life. Then I received news that sucked the wind out of my lungs. He had an affair, separated from his wife, and a few months later committed suicide. Steve said, I felt substantial levels of grief the morning I heard the news. Beyond the obvious, my grief was magnified by the unnecessary nature of the tragedy. If he would have only stayed connected to someone, perhaps a wife would not be a widow, or four daughters would still have their daddy, and the church would still have a loving shepherd, and I would still have my friend. Let this be a wake-up call for all of us. We need each other because isolation is a killer. May not fit, maybe not physically, as in this case, but certainly spiritually. When Jesus sent the disciples out, he sent them out two by two. There was a reason for that. And there is a reason for us to make sure that we're accountable to somebody. You and I were not meant to live alone. We need each other. Amen? Do you already have accountability partners? I appreciate mine so much because I know that I can go to them and I can tell them anything and I know that they will not judge me. They will help me. They will guide me. And they will pray for me. And I want that for all of you. Please prayerfully consider who you might partner with. And let's start to build our spiritual muscles. Amen?